Hola mi gente, this is Leticia Andrade reporting to you live. Welcome to Wisdom Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today's hot, hot topic is spring ahead and prepare for a 2025 real estate market. Part one of two, we're going to be doing back to back uh, appointments um, so that we can go ahead and talk to the sellers today. And then next week, Wednesday, we will talk to our buyers. Good to see everyone. Let's go ahead and bring on. me in this hot hot topic let's go hello everyone thank you so much for joining me yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. hi Leticia oh my gosh it's so good to see you thank you so much for joining me with this wonderful too. hot hot topic uh, that we have today um, so thank you so much so today we're talking about Bringing your head and preparing for the 2025 real estate market, part one of two. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. So let's go ahead and get this party started. Yeah. Anyone that has any questions, please go ahead and type them into the question box or type them into the comments and we'll make sure that we address them as we're speaking. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and start off. We are going to be talking primarily to our sellers today. So let's go ahead and start. Um, where did you want to start, yeah. Sarah? Yeah, so I think we should start talking about how to prep the home and how to prep your paperwork. And oh, I don't know if I lost you. Okay, now we're on do not disturb. So we will have no oh, interruptions. You scared me. I'm like, is it me? Yes, no. Oh, no, do not disturb. We are on and ready now. Okay. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about prepping your house and prepping your paperwork. Those are some of the things that get overwhelming for people when they're starting to think about listing their home, whether it's spring or any time of the year. So one of the things that I first like to start with is always thinking about repairs. And I like to rewind and I make the joke that did you address the repairs that were highlighted in your home inspection when we bought seven years ago, 10 years ago? And oftentimes people forget that they have this easy guide that they already paid for and they can just go back and research what was on there if they've addressed it. Some of the things have been replaced already and won't be an issue. But I think that's a good starting point. And then I like to walk around the home exterior and interior with the seller and talk to them about how a buyer would view their home. And a big one is while you and I, as the, the realtor, the showing agent, we're standing at the front door and we have our phone and we're fidgeting with the lockbox. And what are the buyers doing? They're standing behind us waiting and they are taking in the next step beyond the curb appeal that they saw from the street. They're looking at everything around the door. They're looking at how the front porch or the patio is set up. Uh, any cobwebs, anything that's uh, like a light bulb that doesn't work, things like that. And that's kind of the, the second step of their first impression. And we need to make sure that that is on point. And then when they enter the home, all of the things that they're going to start to see next. And while repairs aren't easily visible, that's what's going to be found out during being under contract. And it's so much easier and less stressful if we address those issues now when we're not under crunch time and we can get three quotes to get our AC repaired or a couple quotes for this and we're not trying to do everything under the gun. And then we can make a better educated decision about what to repair when. And if we need to, we can budget for it. Because right now we're talking about this in fall. And if we don't have the repair money as a seller, this is going to allow us time to get it done before we list in the spring. And I love that we're talking about this now because I feel that it is so important, especially when we're preparing to take our marketing photos to yes. do this in the fall because we still have time to get it a little bit more manicured, making sure all of the exterior is done 
so that possibly we could even do the marketing pictures on the exterior now instead of waiting once the weather changes, once we start getting our first snowfall. And all of that is very important. I think um, even today when we met earlier today, I had that situation where I'm looking at a home and that's exactly our first impression. Even ourselves, it's like, let's think like a buyer. Let's make sure that we walk up to the home, everything is pristine, because guess what? Our front yard, our front porch, and even our backyard, if it's not manicured to the best, it can give the perspective for that buyer to try to either give a lower offer than what we're asking for, because they feel that we're not maintaining yes. and not taking care of the property. So I think that's so important that a lot of sellers don't realize like, hey, all of these little things do matter. And we want to make sure that we present well from the very beginning. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point about professional photos, because when we think spring, we think coming into full lush bushes and trees and flowers. But really, that doesn't come into play until later in May and June when we have everything in full foliage, full bloom. So if we were to take pictures now, that would really benefit sellers who plan to go on almost in advance of the spring market when we're going to have gray skies and dreary things that haven't really come into full bloom yet. And having green leaves and colorful leaves, especially on all the bushes and everything that's changing now, they're kind of starting to fall. But that's another thing that you could potentially plan for. There would be no issue with using late summer or fall photos and then going live in the spring. So yeah, I think that's a good tip. And, and the tip too is um, we don't have to, if they still need time to prepare the inside, that's okay. We mm -hmm. can definitely focus on making sure that we get all of the exterior photos done first. Yeah. So that's where we want to make sure that landscaping is taken care of. That's where we want to make sure that that front door is, you know, pristine. Like you said, the light bulb is changed if it's need be. Things like that so that we don't have to worry about that later. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. All right. So what, what do we think about as far as the market forecast for 2025? Is there any overview or any expectations or trends that we should be on the lookout for to prepare mm -hmm. for the new year, the new market? So I think you and I come from a position of optimism. We, we see an abundance of opportunity in the market. We have a lot of buyers and sellers in our network that we're always working with, even behind the scenes, before they're ready, before paperwork is signed. We know about things coming in advance, and I think for us, that's always a positive thing. So I anticipate a good amount of energy in the market, a good amount of movement. Um, you know, we, we often talk about uh, date the rates and marry the house. So rates are going to fluctuate. They go up and down every day. We can't really predict what they are going to be now or moving into the end of the year or what they could be in the spring. But our job is really to just provide that information, educate people. The lender comes into play and does a, such a great job on that part of this transaction for us. And I think getting aligned on what people are looking for and starting to educate themselves in advance of what they want when they want it um, is only going to help them make the best decision for them and their family when the time comes. And I want to make everyone aware that right now we are still in a seller's market. So for you sellers, guys, if you guys are kind of debating whether or not you think it's a good time to put your house on the market, I say most definitely it is the best time to put your home on the market uh, because we still have low inventory out there, guys. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that you just, you know, demystify anything that you've heard saying, hey, this is not the right time to put your house on the market. I say on the contrary. Yeah. We, ha we still have a lot of buyers out there that are looking for their next home, their, you know, next, you know, um, purchase. So we want to make sure that the sellers know that it's a great time to put your house on the market. We do have a lot of buyer demand out there. Uh, inventory levels, we don't want to um, wait, in my opinion. What do you think about waiting? No, I agree. And I think, okay, so we need to remember people who are showing homes, who are coming to your home as a buyer now in the fall market, 
those are people who have potentially been looking for a while, been looking all summer maybe, and haven't found something. So I don't, I would never say now is a bad time to sell either. So I'm in agreement. Even fall listings and early winter listings are great. But I think we should rewind. We should tell people when we're saying, okay, it's a seller's market, what do we really mean? Yeah. So I think, all right, so let's talk seller's market, buyer's market, and neutral market. So in market time, that's how long from the day your listing goes active on the full market. We're not talking coming soon. We're not talking the private listing network. We're saying when it's on the market, if you're able to sell your home anywhere from zero days to around four-ish months, creeping into five months, you're talking about a seller's market. So, and, and people think, gosh, right now it's like two weeks or less, or it's a week or less. It's the first weekend. Yes, we have been in somewhat of the unicorn years since the pandemic. So we've been in an extreme frenzy of a seller's market. So now that we know that's the general rule of thumb, let's talk about a neutral market. So a neutral market could be, say, four, five, six months max, I would say. That's where there's no real benefit to the buyer or the seller. Now, can you think back to how long it has been since we used to say, oh, you sold your house in four months. That was great. No, no one has said that in years. So it's hard to kind of think that way. And then when you think of a buyer's market, we're talking six, seven, eight, nine months. And that's when buyers really get the pick of the litter. There's so much inventory. They have, they can look at everything endlessly. They can go for a second showing. They can sleep on it. They can go for a third showing. And there's plenty of time. That is not the market that we're in now. We are in a seller's market. And I don't see that changing for the spring either. I still think there's a lot of pent up demand. Absolutely. I agree with you 1000%. Um, people don't understand that once we go and see a property, literally like other people are seeing it. And if we don't make an offer immediately, people think we have, like you said, a couple of days. I've seen um, homes get off the market within three days on the market. And I don't know if you've seen the same or, or what do you feel the time frame has been that you've seen um, when you are working with a buyer? Yeah, so from, okay, so let's, I wanna go first from seller point of view and how I sure. talk about that. And then let's talk about buyer. Okay, so when I am talking to sellers, I typically recommend going live on a Thursday. And Thursday is somewhat of the golden day of the week. If you're going to have an open house, that allows you enough time to start circulating your events online, your social media, getting exposure. Um, your listing is going to go on the MLS on Thursday. It's going to syndicate to all the websites, Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, all of those sites where people are looking for that tour slash open house field. So we're going to go live on a Thursday. If we're still there on Monday, right, that is our fifth day on the market. People start to think, oh gosh, I, did I make it in time? Did I miss the window? It's probably already sold. They probably already had multiple offers this weekend. So I think from that standpoint, yeah, like you're seeing once you get to the five day mark, it starts to be like, I wonder if that home is still available. Yes. And that's great right now. So from a buyer standpoint, like you were asking, that's kind of the, the approach there. We, we regroup, we um, talk about everything on Thursday and Friday. We make our plans for the weekend. We try to hit everything. If we can't get it in, they're potentially going to open houses without me and then reporting back so that we can maximize all of the places that they'd like to see as soon as possible and then get us in there if we need to write an offer it's literally you know we're there at the showing i'm calling the listing agent from the street and i'm saying okay i just showed one two three main street what can you tell me about the property and leaving that open-ended question to try and get more information about the status of where we're at in the event that we were to write an offer and i love, love that so how do you feel as a listing agent um i usually say yes let's go ahead and put the mark the property on the market on a thursday mm -hmm. Are you also preparing for open house on Saturday, Sunday, or how do you feel about the open house when we're dealing with our sellers? Yes, I typically, you know, it depends on the seller's preference, their level of privacy, their comfort with having an open house. If it's possible, then yes, it is nice. I do suggest it. Um, I don't have a preference over a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, I really think it depends on the agent's availability and the seller's availability too, getting it ready. If the home is vacant, then by all means, we have you know less personal property to worry about, and I suggest to do it. Um, I've had great success this year. Um, I hosted an open house in Lombard in the early spring, and we had 23 groups through. 
And then I had a listing in Mount Prospect where they had 45 groups through the open house. We ended up with a total of 99 showings My and we got 22 offers. So that home closed for $50,000 over list price. So these are some of the things I think that are really important to talk about in your listing presentation or your listing consultation with that seller to talk them all the way through about what's our strategy going to be. You know, you brought up an open house. Is that going to be one of the, the spokes on our wheel to get us to the finish line? So there's a lot of different marketing things that we can do to help our sellers. Well, this is where it brings us a great segue to talk about our pricing strategy how to approach the pricing in a potential fluctuating market, mm -hmm. including the benefits of competitive pricing and recent comparable sales data. Yes. So that gives us a great segue into getting into that topic. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your biggest tip for sellers on a great pricing strategy right now in this market? Yep. So I never advise sellers to overprice. There is somewhat of a, like a, you mentioned demystifying things. Yes. There's yes. a myth out there that we should overprice because people are going to lowball us. People are always going to offer lower. That has not been the case in this market. And I like to provide data for my sellers, specifically even going down to the town level, not just looking at the overall MLS or the county that their home is in, but I also like to look all the way down to that level, like say Lombard, for instance. And I wanna look at potentially the detached single family homes in Lombard and what they have sold for. Have they sold for 96% in buyer's market years? Have they sold for that much or have they been selling at 101 percent 102 percent of list price so then we need to align ourselves properly so that we think of the funnel effect we want the we want a funnel right we want the most people to start out to see our home look amazing online that's our first foot forward then we want people to mark us as interested they want to tell we want them as buyers for our listing to tell their agent that hey we have to go see 123 main street it just came out it looks amazing we got to get there that's the second step then the third step is them booking that showing and getting in the door so the wider we make our funnel at the top the better our photos are the better our pricing strategy is and it, we've also talked about bridge pricing so say for example take 650 as a as a price yeah are people looking from 650 to 750 are they looking from 500 to 650 we have to find the sweet spot for that pricing because we want to show up on every buyer's search possible so we're trying to get as many people in the door and um, I like to look when I'm doing my CMAs, comparative market analysis, and we're looking, you know, potentially one mile from the property. We want to look around the same square footage, around the same age. And then we talk about the generalities that we always look for first, bedroom count, bathroom count, garage count, um, if it has a basement, et cetera. And we want to look at where the average of all of those properties are and see then, okay, from that average, are we better? Is our kitchen remodeled? Are we potentially a newer build? How, um, maybe we have more square footage or extra rooms. And we wanna gauge it from there because we cannot miss the mark. Because market time, extended market time right now is the kiss of death. That's the negative thing that we could put ourselves in a bad position and we don't wanna do that. We wanna go from the, the most positive, most powerful position right from the beginning of our listing to get the most buyers. Ooh. I love that. And I love how these um, show them the data. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. I think yes. numbers don't lie. And if we can provide them with all the data, the more that they are going to listen to a professional real estate broker like us in where we should price the home. And it's like we give them the black and white. Mm -hmm. We give them the, the good information that they need so that we can make sure that that property is priced right so that we have the least market time so that we can sell the home for top dollar wouldn't you agree top dollar yes i mean that that's everyone's satisfaction if you can hit that mark and then get multiple offers because when you drill down the multiple offers 
there are never going to be two offers the same. We're talking about a lot of different components. Their financing type, the amount of earnest money they're offering us, when they would like to close, if they're buying as is, if they're using uh, financing and they're going to waive that appraisal gap, if there potentially is one, if they're going way above list price. There's so many components. So uh, we really want to be able to negotiate from a position of power. And the more offers we receive, the more powerful our position is in negotiating. So I love what you just said. And I want to kind of pick your brain on those 22 offers that you got for your seller. How did you present those offers to your seller? What was your strategy? Yes. Like you're, you're saying, where is the positioning? Because like you said, no offer is the same offer. So how was that dealt with as far as 22 offers? How did you, you dissect those 22 offers and were able to present to that seller so that the seller could understand all the benefits and all the things mm -hmm. that a buyer is offering the seller? Yes. And what do you think? And right now, just as, there's a couple of things that came in there that I want to make sure that our audience understands. You said waiving a, um, uh, like an appraisal gap yep. waiver, mm -hmm. um, maybe waiving inspection. Are we um, obtaining that property as is? Mm -hmm. Some of these things we want to dissect a little bit so that the sellers could understand, hey, that's why we're in a seller's market. You have a little bit more options on who you choose to move forward with. Yes. Okay, so for starters, our job as agents uh, is to relay the offer as soon as it comes in. So I like to send it over to the seller and copy whoever is in their family, whoever is making that decision with them, get it in their hands right away. When we start to get to multiple offers, I have a standard spreadsheet that I use that line items where what agent submitted that offer and what type of financing they're using. And then we have columns all the way across the spreadsheet. So we're talking about when they want to close, how much earnest money they've offered us, what their purchase price is. And that's one of the key factors that gets us to a net to the seller all the way across that spreadsheet. So then if they're asking for a closing cost credit, uh, what their tax prorations are. So some people will ask for less tax prorations or sometimes they'll ask for no tax prorations. And that's a negotiating strategy. Um, if they are asking for a home warranty, if they're offering to us to buy our property as is, then if there's the sneaky escalation clause, which a lot of people forget about, a lot of agents don't use or don't prefer, but I think that's a, a strong way to position yourself as a buyer if you are able to. Then we have the appraisal gap waiver. And then now, right now, with the changes in our industry this year, we have the addendum for the seller's agreement to pay the buyer's brokerage compensation. And then at the end of that spreadsheet, we compile all of those numbers and we look at the seller net. So we can't just look at the seller net because we've got to look at when they'd like to close. Then we can kind of dissect down into what financing type they use and then how strong amongst those financing types they are and what their percentage of down payment is. So imagine every time I got up to 22 offers, I was sending over that offer packet, I was updating my spreadsheet and I was adding it on. So when I was talking to that family, every time we spoke, it was really easy because we were literally saying, oh, offer number eight is the one. Oh, but offer number 10, that one looks really good too. And there was no confusion. And I think a big part of our job as realtors, as we're advocating for our clients is taking stress off of their plate. And when you're selling your home, especially when it's owner occupied and you're occupying the home, not only do you have the emotional attachment to that home, you have a lot of other things going on. You're trying to pack, you're trying to think about where your next home's gonna be. And the last thing we need to do is have our sellers stressed over the amazing situation we've gotten them into with 22 offers. So I think that's an easy way to do it, to kind of make things very simple, look at it plain black and white on paper, and then we can gather our thoughts and our knowledge together to pick the strongest offer and then get them to the closing table because that's the ultimate goal i love it and and even listening to the process on your aspect even the 22 offers that even sounds overwhelming mm -hmm. now we broke it down we yep. broke it down so easy that we in our seller consultation we explained if that situation comes up how oh. are we going to handle it up front 
so that mm -hmm. everybody's on the same page and everybody has a calm, easy going, um, you know, experience. I think yes. that is super important and I love that. Yes. Um, so that's definitely something that um, on that multiple offer situation is definitely going to bring our clients at ease. And I love that. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, marketing tactics that stand out. Um, we've already kind of um, talked a little bit more on the buyer in making the offer and all these little tactics that they may mm -hmm. use, but is sure. there anything that a seller can do that's going to be effective marketing strategies that, um, you know, we could kind of push our sellers to do? I got a couple of ideas as well. So I just kind of want to hear where do you go where we're like talking to our sellers about some of the marketing um, tactics that stand out for you? Yes. So I think preparing the home for professional photos, because everyone relies so heavily on those photos, your from your curb appeal to the inside of the home. I like to think that your, your moneymaker inside the home is typically the kitchen and the bathrooms. We have to have those high dollar components ready because we've spent money on countertops and appliances and beautiful light fixtures. And we want to present all of those in the best way. So that's typically right after I do the exterior photos. Usually I do one front photo when I'm doing the order. I want to get people right in to see the kitchen. If we have a beautiful kitchen, I want them to see it. So that's a little bit of the marketing behind strategizing for photos. Then we have um, a lot of videos that we can do. So you're great at that. Yes. I mean, you've even done it at one of my listings. Yes. You walked through and did your kind of show and tell, pulling the car in the garage, walking through all the way out to the front of the building and showing how great that building was. So I think that's one of the great marketing things that you do. What are some of the other tips that you were thinking of? Yeah, I think that the power of social media is so important, and that's where um, – some of the videos come into play, but social media, I actually sold one of my listings from social media. They saw on my video, they came to my open house and that's what also opens the door for a lot more uh, views, a lot more people coming into the door, physically seeing the home or the condo and, you know, resulting in an offer and resulting in a closed contract. So I am just super excited to always make sure that, like you said, we're getting the curb appeal, we're getting all of it into play and producing a great video so that we could get more exposure to our listings. Yeah. The most exposure, the more people, like you said, we're going to get in the door to actually look at the unit. And then we have a lot more potential of people actually pu pulling the trigger mm -hmm and making an offer. And I think that's the ultimate goal for us. So a lot of people, um, when we say social media, we're not just talking about Instagram, we're talking about YouTube, we're talking about TikTok, we're talking about um, Snapchat. I know a lot of people also use Snapchat. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different um, social media platforms that we could use to our benefit. Yes. And so when we have a good, um, media, when we have great photos, when we have a great video, the more exposure we give the property, the more potential that we're going to sell it quicker. Yes. And like you said, timing is of the essence. Yes, it is. Yes. So let's go into, um, wow, we kind of like touched little, already about navigating through thing. offers and negotiations. Is there anything else that we could kind of add um, to our uh, seller list to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about what, what do we think? So we're kind of like in a good timing right now. We're at six 30 right now. So, yep. um, what, what would you say would be kind of like to our closer? Wrap it up. Statement? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I would say similar to what we would tell a buyer, have that talk with your professional sooner rather than later so that you could start to be prepared. So things that would come to mind is, you know, you want to start pulling together your estimate, uh, your estimate of utilities. You want to get your plan of survey out. You want to see how the home is titled. Any of those things that need to be adjusted, the more time you have, the better. 
Um, we want to think about how much are left on your loans. Do you have one loan? Do you have two loans? Because if we need an attorney to pull numbers for you to go on to that next property as a seller, you're potentially going to be a buyer during this time or immediately after this time. And if we need to know how much you need for a down payment, that's important. And then also potentially talking to your lender who is going to be doing your loan for your next property. One of the most important things we're going to ask is, is your next purchase contingent upon the sale of the home that you're living in right now? And the sooner we have that answer, the sooner we can plan. If it's not contingent, great. Potentially we can purchase and have a little bit of time in between if you'd like to do paint and carpet and things like that. If you'd like to move first, if you wanna show your home while it's vacant and you've already moved into your next property, or if we know that we have to potentially close on the same day, or if we have family that we can rely on to where we could close early and then we would have all the proceeds from this sale before we move. So I think starting to talk to a professional earlier rather than later helps our sellers just become more educated so they're ready. And again, less stress. It's all about less stress. So um, if we can take all of that off of their plate and have the process be smooth and seamless, I think those are great tips. I love it. And Sarah, um, we're touching upon some great um, tips moving and segueing into next week. Next, next week. week yeah, yes. Next week, we're going to talk about what the buyers need to know. And I love that. This is a great segue. So please stay tuned with Sarah and myself from Fulton Grace, where we're going to segue and we're going to talk about next Wisdom Wednesday about what the buyers need to know. And so I think this is a great segue. Um, how can people find you, Sarah? I know we said we're from Fulton Grace, but I want to yes. make sure that um, people start following you if they are not. And then obviously, we are looking for sellers that want that seller consultation. So we want to educate as much as we can with these Wisdom Wednesdays. And that's why I only ask of the best. So that's why I asked Sarah to come Thank online with me so we can you. talk about what the sellers need to know. And that, that brought us to our part two, because we don't want to give too much information all at once. No. We got into the part two for next Wisdom Wednesday, letting you guys know what the buyers need to know. So go ahead and, and let us know how we can find you or what's the best way to contact you. Yes. Yeah, so so I would say reach out to me, um, phone, text. You can find me on my socials, which are Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. I have a Yelp business page. Read some reviews on Zillow. Check out my Google business page. Um, I mean, you and I work so well together. I know that we have a co-marketing listing that we're going to be working on together in the spring. You and I are easy to find. <laughs> we're always on social media. Yeah. We're, we're very approachable. So I'm so happy that we're able to do this together, bring education and insight to our, our current clients, our future clients, and um, really looking forward to working with you on the, the next uh, segment as well. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone stay tuned for our buyer segment, our part two of this two-part series in what buyers need to know moving into the 2025 market. market. Um, so yeah, um, so we're going to spring ahead and we're going to um, get it rocking and rolling. And we're here to provide you with professional real estate um, tips and tricks and anything that you can do in making sure that you have us as your professional real estate brokers to confide in and to let us help you because we're here to help. Yes. Well, thank awesome. you so much. Looking forward to seeing everyone next week. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate okay. you. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye.